Good afternoon. A very warm welcome on this rather warm day in Norwich and a little bit uh, behind schedule because of technical problems, I'm afraid, but a very warm welcome to St. Peter Mancroft Church and our Wednesday one o'clock reflection. If you're looking around the church or sitting in the church, you're very welcome to carry on doing that. And a welcome to those watching online as well. My name is Catherine Wadhams. I'm one of the lay ministers here. And today I'd like to talk about leadership. As Conservative Party members elect a new leader and the next Prime Minister of the country, this seems a good moment to reflect on leadership more generally. I won't dwell on the merits of the policies or even the personalities of Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. There is plenty of noise and information available about that. But rather, I'd like to think more generally about what it is that makes for good leadership of a country or indeed of any organization. The management literature is full of inspirational writing on 10 ways to recognize a good leader or five tips for effective leadership. These are often built around confidence, optimism, decisiveness, passion. But I was interested to see humility introduced as one of the factors. As in any contest where each side is trying to persuade people to buy for their particular product or vote for their candidate rather than the opposition, humility doesn't often feature very largely in the current election. But St. Benedict of Nursia had quite a lot to say about humility in his rule which underpinned the religious communities which he founded 1,500 years ago, initially in Italy. This rule remained the basis of the majority of monasteries and convents in the centuries which followed, including the one here, based at the cathedral in Norwich. They still read extracts from the rule in recognition of their Benedictine foundation. Benedict himself was born into a wealthy family but when he went off to Rome as a young man to be educated, he rebelled against the pleasure-seeking ways of the city. Interestingly, he particularly disliked the Roman approach to leadership, which emphasized power, privilege, prestige, honor. He stopped his studies, became a hermit, lived for three years in a cave, relishing the solitude and seeking God. It's ironic, I think, that his reputation for wisdom, humility, and godliness drew large crowds of people who did want to follow him and called to him to lead. So he established communities where followers could also seek God and confront the contemporary pagan culture, thus founding the monastic tradition in Western Europe. It was for these communities that he wrote his rule, 73 short chapters of guidance. More than half of these deal with how to be obedient and humble and how to deal with members of the community who are not. About a quarter of the chapters deal with the work of God and a tenth with managing the community. Leadership courses are a common part of organizations today and often provide a valuable opportunity for reflection and exchange of ideas. I remember when our head of department went on such a course when I was a young lecturer. He rearranged his office to be less intimidating for visitors and colleagues when he returned and was obviously trying to implement a more gentle approach than his natural, rather noisy bluster, rather to our amusement. Many of us felt we should have been sent on a corresponding followers course to know how best to respond to this new head of department. I think things slipped back into their old ways pretty quickly. Perhaps we should all have studied the Benedictine rules together. Benedict suggested 12 instructions on humility, and these have been translated into modern guidelines by many management writers. The ideas remain really quite relevant. 
whether we're aspiring leaders or indeed more regular followers, whether we're in a formal organisation or just in our daily lives. Each of these ideas is described as a degree of humility. And what I'm going to read out is their modern aspects as described by Craig and Oliver Galbraith in a much quoted book, Classic Management Secrets You Can Use Today. Here's their suggested template. First, follow the basic rules of courtesy and the organization. Model good behavior to those around you. Second, curb your personal desires, particularly for fame and achievement, ever aware of the dangers of pride and arrogance. Third, obey others placed over you in positions of authority. Fourth, endure affliction. Humble leaders willingly turn the other cheek in situations of conflict and work towards peace and harmony. Fifth, acknowledge your weaknesses. Be honest and transparent about your own limitations and weaknesses and communicate these regularly to those that follow you. Practice contentment. Try to be content in your current position, your job, your general situation in life. Seven, reflect honestly on your own contribution and don't seek to place the blame on others. Eight, obey the common rule. Obey all the organizational rules, not just in the letter, but in the spirit. Ninth, understand that silence is golden. Humble leaders control their speech and adopt plain and clear avenues of communication. Ten, consciously seek to cultivate humility and understand what this means in an organizational setting. Eleven, speak simply, talk in a low voice, Speak gently and with kindness to everyone in the organization. And lastly, act humbly in appearance as well as in the heart. Benedict's version of this last guideline was that a monk should show his humility in his posture. He should always have his head bowed and his eyes towards the ground. That might not be very practical for us. And I interpret it for today as not always looking around uh, to see where the main chance might be. I suppose don't show off might be another modern interpretation. When organizations I've been in have needed to identify a leader, perhaps a head of department, I've often felt that the best candidate would be someone who doesn't want the position. Often the people who do want to be leaders do so for reasons which are diametrically opposed to these principles of humility. Because they are sure that their ideas are better than others. Because they seek the power and the glory which Benedict rejected when he went to Rome. While those who do have good qualities don't seek such privilege and prestige. It can be a difficult conundrum for those who are choosing leaders either in organizations or indeed in political parties. And what do we expect of our leaders once they are chosen? Good communication for sure, both in listening and speaking. But one role of leadership is making difficult choices where there's no obvious right answer. The debates between Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak and their supporters over how best to tackle the cost of living crisis and the energy price increases demonstrate that there aren't likely to be easy answers. And these choices have to be made by fallible humans, however much their supporters hype their credentials and rubbish those of the opponents. Part of the humility of a leader is knowing that they'll sometimes get things wrong and being open with themselves and with others about this. Unfortunately, we don't see much room for fallibility in the current contest. But let's hope that the winner will practice some humility when they become leader of their party and of the country. 
and that those of us who might be critical will understand the difficulties which they face, as well as be constructive in suggesting alternatives. Benedict's approach may be particularly relevant for Christians today in a largely secular world. Conditions are not so different from Benedict's time, 1,500 years ago in Rome, when the prevailing faiths were pagan and fed those ideals of power-hungry leadership and sense of privilege. And I can't help wondering what we might learn directly from Jesus' own model of leadership. He is often described as a servant leader, and in terms of humility, he was very clear that his inspiration and influence came from his father rather than himself, and that his own successes reflected God's glory. But he was also not afraid to challenge, particularly the established powers of his time. And his message followed the Jewish tradition of favoring those without obvious worldly power. I'm not sure how good he would have been at obeying others, except for his own father in heaven, or indeed organizational rules, or keeping silent. Jesus would surely be on the side of those who are most vulnerable in our current cost of living crisis, as well as of each person who is marginalized in our current society. He provides a model for us to be not only humble, but also subversive in challenging any leader who does not share these priorities for the weakest in our society. So Benedict's steps towards humility are a really good starting point for any community or organization, including a political party, providing space also to listen to prophetic voices. One thing all good leadership has in common is the humility to listen to others and to hear ideas and experiences which are often drowned out by those who shout loudest. This would help in implementing Benedict's advice that a leader should temper all things so that the strong may still have something to work for and the weak may not give up hope. The strong have something to work for and the weak may not give up hope. Not a bad rule for any leader, including that of our country. Thank you.